welcome friends to this celebration of great masters bandara in these two days that we are here tomorrow 2nd of april is the day the great master left his physical body but became visible to his disciples in a form that will always stay with them this is one of the great blessings of a perfect living master that he comes in a human form and becomes an ordinary person like ourselves and yet he is not ordinary because he manifests another form of his within ourselves and even when he dies in his physical body he does not leave us and is available to us 24/7 that's a very very useful thing to remember that a master once he initiates us accepts us says you are my friend he is with you forever and we may not realize it while the master is alive but we if we have done a basic homework before he dies in his physical body and can talk to him in meditation he will be with us forever and this forever means more than forever as we understand it it means he will be with us all the way till we go back to our true home sachkant tomorrow is the anniversary of this great day of my master's bandara for me it's a very important day and i have seen that it is very important for everybody else who joins me in the bandara it's very important because i see him personally blessing everybody who is present with me so 2nd april has become a very important day in my life and ever since he passed away in 1948 i have not missed this day to see him blessing people <coughs> in a way which i can see many others can see but many others cannot see because they never saw him in his physical form but the blessing he is giving i can see is being given to everybody who is present so that is why i say it's a very great day for human beings for humanity as a whole to be present and get that kind of a blessing because once you get that blessing your going back to your true home is guaranteed nothing more is needed just being present on this day and my being witness to his giving blessings to those who are present is a guarantee they go back to their true home in time they will find their own perfect living master in a human form in time they will meditate in time they will make progress in time they will go back home and that time is also very limited because if we believe in the cycle of birth and rebirth and if we believe in transmigration of our soul in different forms we have been here for a very long time and we could be here for a very long time too long time could be millions of earth years and could be millions of cycles of our earth time so that is why to be able to escape from here an area of experience which is not our true home and go back to where we really belong where we don't have this problem of duality problem of pairs of opposites that you cannot have happiness unless you have unhappiness that you cannot have light unless you have darkness that you cannot have pleasure unless you have pain this kind of world which entirely believes in duality and pairs of opposites is not where our true home is our true home does not have these pairs of opposites and the bliss that we have there is a continuous source of intense joy and bliss intense awareness of everything and that's something that you cannot imitate here at all nor can you really describe it but it is good to know that if we have made a trip to these experiences in a physical world or in other experiences in so called astral and causal worlds where we can have an existence without physical body where we can have existence with sensory perceptions and a mind and a soul alone where we can have existence with the mind alone those are also states in which we are we have been going through 
and we can go through again. In the meditational techniques that we follow, it's just a method of discovering who we are. It's a method of discovering whether we have other forms of ourselves or only the physical form that we look at. These methods are very simple. They are all based on one simple principle, which all the mystics, all the saints, all the enlightened people, all over the world have been telling us. And the simple principle is go within. If you go within yourself, you find it. If we have to find our own self, which better place is it to find except your own self? If you are looking for the self, it has to be within yourself. It cannot be outside. So that is why the discovery of the self is the most important part of our spiritual growth and spiritual realization. The discovery of the self will reveal something very interesting, which we cannot see right here. It will reveal that the self is the conscious power, the creative conscious power that creates all experiences, including all experiences of created worlds. That the created worlds that we see outside at different levels are also being created from the power of our own consciousness. And this is, cannot be seen when we take an external reality to be more real than ourselves. When we take an external world to be more real than ourselves, we get caught up in this external world and we believe that's the only reality. We begin to believe we are a very small speck in a large universe that has been pre-existing for billions of years and we have just come for a little while and in a short while we'll go away. We'll die and go away. We don't go anywhere. We have never gone anywhere. We cannot go anywhere. The self is immortal. The self cannot die. The self will always create an experience to be alive. The self will always be consciousness, being conscious of something. It's an eternal thing. It is not that we are physically going to be forever. It's just a simple physical body that we are wearing. Body that we wear physically are really no more than my wearing a jacket. I'm wearing a jacket. I can't say I'm the jacket. The reason why I don't say I'm the jacket is because I still realize I am wearing the jacket. But when we wear a human body, we forget that we are wearing a body. We think that's us. This misidentification with a covering upon ourselves as our own self is leading to so much trouble. In fact, it's leading to all the troubles we have. If you look at all your lives, you look at all the problems we have, look at all the suffering we have. It's only because of misidentification that we are the physical body. That we are the physical body that has sense perceptions. That we are a physical body that has a mind that can think. That the mind is a function of the physical body in a brain. A sense perceptions are sense organs written into us. Since we misidentify that this is our self, we have all the problems of the world. Now, shift your attention slightly. Shift your attention to the fact that the physical body is not yourself. Is a covering upon yourself. And that you have a self within this body, overlapping this body, which has all the sense perceptions that the physical body has. The power to see, the power to hear, the power to touch, smell, taste. These we ascribe to the physical body, but if they were only in the physical body, you could never have it in a dream or in an imagination. Because in a dream, you don't have the physical body. It's a dream body. In imagination, you don't have a physical body. You imagine things. And yet we can have all these imaginations and we can have experiences of all the sense perceptions even when we are in the physical body. And we can have these other experiences, which shows that these sensory experiences are not really part of the physical body. They are embedded in the physical body. They are functioning through the physical body. Now, is there a way to check this out, what I am saying? Yes, it's very simple. The simplest way is to become unaware of this body. If you became unaware of this body, what would happen? There are two or three kinds of unawareness. One is, you can go to sleep. When you go to sleep, you become unaware of this body. You can have a dream in a sleep. You become unaware of this body. 
but you suddenly become aware of another body. You suddenly find that you're moving around, you're doing things where the body, physical body is sleeping. Now, which is that dream body? What is that dream body consisting of? The dream body is consisting of a different level of consciousness than the physical reality of the physical body. In the dream body, you can be in one place in one second, another place in another second, move shift from one city to another in a second, looks absolutely normal. Nobody has ever questioned in a dream, how can I do this? Why am I doing this? It all looks so natural. Because in the dream body, our experiences are based upon the rules of that dream body of a dream. We can also be unconscious of the body when we forget our dreams and we have deep sleep and we say we don't know and we wake up and between sleeping and wakefulness, we don't know. But then we don't know how much time has passed except unless we look at the watch. There is no other way to know how long you slept. That is why we can have many ways of becoming unaware of our body. But if you want to know if there is something higher in consciousness than the dream body or the physical body by becoming unaware of the body, then you have a practical way of doing it. And that is to work out where you function from when you are in the wakeful state. And you discover that in the wakeful state, your attention is flowing from your head through the eyes. That you look at everything through the eyes. You are focusing yourself that you are apparently sitting in the head. You can even feel that the rest of the body is attached to you. And you are in the head. By little practice, one can develop a greater awareness of the fact that you are actually as units of consciousness in a wakeful state in a human body behind the eyes. If you now close your eyes and then imagine you are there and put your attention on being there in your imagination, what will happen? You will just go on thinking of that, you will go on concentrating there and gradually you won't know where your hands and feet are. After some practice in this kind of meditation, meditation upon yourself, you will forget you have a body another body will open up, like a dream body. But this body will be far more real because it will have an enhanced sensory perception than the dream or the physical body ever has. Your sense perceptions will become so heightened. You'll be able to see better, hear better, touch better, do everything better. And then you know that you are in a higher state of consciousness. Also, if you are able to develop this experience further, in meditation, you will also find that you were in that body, in that form, way before you ever had a physical body. So therefore, that experience of withdrawing your attention from the physical world, from the physical body, and putting attention on your own self, where your consciousness is operating right now, enables you to become unaware of this body as your other awareness opens up. That's precisely what is meant by going within. Going within means putting your attention within your own self. So long as we have a physical body, within means within our physical body. Once we are in that other form, we find that the other form can fly. It has capability. This physical body doesn't have. It, it has power of understanding people all the time telepathically. It has the power Somebody speaks to you in German, you don't know German, you speak English, the telepathic communication conveys the meaning, which also happens here accidentally sometimes. Here people who have telepathic communication, they know that it's not the language that is transmitted. Somebody can say in any language, the other person who doesn't know the language can understand it telepathically, but not physically. So same thing happens in that sensory state or astral state that you have different way of communicating different way of remembering things. So the whole life, which is much longer life than you had in the physical body, opens up. Now this is a personal experience. Instead of just believing there is such a thing that you can have going within, do it and experience yourself. Because what I am sharing with you in these two days is the teaching of great master, picture you see here, Azul Maharaj Baba Savan Singh, my teacher and my master. He's a great master, the greatest. I have not seen 
anything in the world greater than that. So that is why you will notice that the great master teaching says by withdrawing your attention within yourself, you can do it. And he says, don't believe anybody, not even your master, if you haven't experienced yourself. I like that part of the teaching. No scope for blind faith at all. Do not believe if you haven't experienced. But do not say, I don't believe somebody else's experience if you haven't had it. It does not mean that if you haven't had an experience, you denounce everybody else. They may have had the experience. So you believe up to the point where you have your experience. Any experience. Any experience you have personally, believe because it's your experience. And don't believe it's real. Believe it's an experience. Because it is only an experience. It's not reality. That also you'll find out that in a dream, we have so many experiences, they look real. Experience is real. We are dreaming. But we wake up. The experience was still real. We can remember it. But the things that we saw in the dream were not real. The same thing is true about this physical state also. The same thing is true of the astral and causal stages also. The same thing is true of all stages of creation. That these are merely experiences generated which look like reality and we make them into reality. So that's a great way to create reality. So that is how these different realities have been created. And we have the power to go within ourselves by simple techniques. Simple techniques modernized for the current age. There used to be very hard techniques earlier. People had more time. There were no televisions. There were no iPhones, no dis distractions. And they, all the time they had to just eat and meditate and sleep. So now we don't have that. We have too many distractions, too many things occupying us, too much obligations we have created around ourselves. Therefore, for the modern age, this has become a little easier in a way for us to meditate than it was in the earlier days. So we should take advantage. We are born in a good age where we have some shortcuts available. They were not available earlier. Now, <clears throat> there, are, there are many shortcuts. The shortcut that we can do is that instead of trying so hard to meditate, to put our attention inside, to visualize we are inside, and then to spend so much time in trying to do that and put all the effort we can, we can listen to an inner music. We all have music inside. We have a song going on inside. It's so beautiful. It's so wonderful. Instead of trying things hard, I'll give you a shortcut now. The shortcut is listen to the sound, the music inside. It is so melodious if you can catch it. There are many sounds apart from the sound of your breathing, sound of your heartbeat. If you are in a very quiet place, you can hear them. Or sound of making your belly or something. And if you have eaten the wrong kind of food or whatever. And many sounds you can hear in the body. But there is a sound emanating from, coming from our own consciousness. From our own soul. That sound is very different from any other sound. Most sounds that we hear have some little harshness in them. That's the sweetest and most melodious song. It does not have any harsh beat into it. And that sound has a power. If you are able to listen to that sound, then the sound is so wonderful, it pulls you up and gives you the experiences of locating your body and having the inner experiences. That's a great shortcut. That you don't have to do anything. Let the sound work for you. Let the sound pull you. And what is that sound? How can it pull you? There must be some secret behind that sound that it can pull you. Sounds can't pull normally. They can make you entertained. They can uh, make you feel happy. But how can a sound pull you? The reason is, this inner sound comes from our own self. And when we try to listen to it attentively, you are pulling to your own self. Its own self that is not the cover of your body. That is why the sound enables you to go further in. Now, I, it might surprise people to know that that sound is the creative power 
It is an expression of consciousness that is creating the whole world. How can sound create a whole world? Actually, it's not sound. It's not sound at all. It is the creative power. It is the Godhead. It's the word described in, in the Bible by John in his opening verses. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. We talk of that word. We talk of Shabd that created everything. That Shabd created the sky, the earth, the Shabd created everything. Shabd is Shabd Bhaya Prakash. Shabd created Shabd itself. We talk of that power. And yet the word Shabd means a sound. Word means the audible thing. Why have these words been used? Why couldn't we use creative power? Why couldn't we say by any other name? Why have all these great religions, great spiritual traditions, all called it by something that can be audible, that can be heard? Must be some good reason. The highest power that creates everything should be called a sound or be called a word. The reason is simple. That creative power is making ourself, is making ourself, is making everything, including the creator. That creative power that makes the creator, that makes ourselves, that keeps on having that great power, at a certain point, it can be heard or felt like a resonance. And from the resonance, it can be felt like a sound. In the physical body, when we are in the physical world, the same thing appears like a sound. It does not mean it's a sound. It's sound only for a little while. When you listen to that sound and the sound pulls you, it does not remain a sound all the time. It keeps on changing your experiences and keeps on changing and itself keeps on changing from a sound that can be heard. It can become a sound that seems to be endless. It becomes a sound that cannot be heard but can be felt, can be experienced. It becomes a sound that becomes the creator and you and everything. Ultimately, it is all, all total totality of consciousness itself, the sound. The very fact that we can hear it as an audible thing in a physical body is what makes us call it a sound. So don't mistake it that just as noise like a sound can take you anywhere. If sound could take us, we could hear all the music of the world. And not go anywhere. This internal sound is merely an expression of our own self, which, which we, does not need anything else to be aware of to know who you are. Otherwise, if you want to know we are conscious, we have to see what we are conscious of. And that is why we understand consciousness from what we are conscious of and we look at things from there. But the sound itself is coming from its own eminence, from its own source. It's part of the source. And that is why I call it a shortcut. That if you can catch the sound, therefore according to my understanding, my practice, my following of the teachings of this great master, the secret is the sound. That is why this particular method of uniting yourself with the merger of self, with the totality, is called Surt Shabd Yoga. In India, we call it Surt Shabd Yoga. Surt means attention. Shabd means a sound. Yoga means union with your totality. So it's simply putting attention on the sound to get the realization. Now, people can say, where can we hear the sound? They try to hear the sound. They can't hear the sound. Why can't we hear a sound if it is already in us, in all of us? There is no exception. You would not be alive if the sound was not there. Sound is life. Sound is what makes you alive. So, how come the very thing that is making us alive, we can't hear? Simply because the thing that hears, the part of us that hears, is called attention. Our attention is not on the sound. Attention is all scattered in an experience outside. Our attention is completely scattered outside. First, it is scattered in the body. We don't stay where we are supposed to be. It is scattered, we are aware of the whole body, constantly. We are continuously considering this body to be ourself and therefore the attention makes the body alive. Then from the body, we become conscious of everything that comes in contact with the body, including the whole physical world. 
So the attention is so scattered, it's so spread out all over, that how can we hear the sound? Is the same attention that has to hear the sound. Therefore, we have, by our own lifestyle, by our own way of living, prevented ourselves from hearing something that is in all of us. So what is the way to pull the attention from things where it is spread out? That is why we use meditation as a technique. Meditation is not an end in itself. You can't say I've been meditating, therefore I've realized soul. People have been meditating all their lives and got nothing out of it. People have been meditating and thinking of the whole world. If you meditate by closing your eyes, chanting words, but your mind is running all over the rest of the world, that is not going to help you at all. Meditation is where you can withdraw your attention from where it is scattered and bring it back to behind the eyes where you are in the physical world. It's as simple as that. Therefore, when we practice good meditation, high quality meditation, we do not just spend time in closing our eyes and chanting. We close our eyes in order not to obstruct our own vision by looking outside. We close our ears, we don't obstruct ourselves from hearing outside things. We try to sit within that little chamber, small chamber, on top of our head. In the physical world, this is again, this body, physical body, is the best thing that ever happened. Because only in this body you can have this experience. There are two good reasons for that. One, when you are in a physical body, you have the entire equipment to have all experiences that you like, including experience of your true, all the hells and heavens, all the experience of all higher levels of awareness and ultimately a true home can all be experienced in a human body. A great thing. They say it's a temple of the living God. They say not temple of a God who we don't see and we worship outside. This is a temple of a living God because God alive is making you alive. That's why when you go into this temple, the temple that is your own human body, you find a living God. You don't find God in pictures or in statues or in images. You find a living true God. The true God who, of whom you are a part and who has made all creation possible. This is one great advantage of having a human body. The second big advantage which is also necessary is that in this human body we have a strange experience called free will. We have the experience of making choices. We have the experience that there are options available to us and we make a choice. We don't believe that the creator set up everything and he knows what's going on. We believe no. Creator did his job. He created us. Now he left it to us to make choices and do what we like. And yet, when we define the creator, when we define God, we say he's omnipresent, omnipotent, present everywhere, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing. Does God know what we are going to decide? Supposing I have a question tomorrow, should I go to the right or the left? And I say, I can decide, right or left. Does God know it or not? No. If he doesn't, he is not God by this definition. And if he knows, he knows in advance what I am going to decide, left or right. And supposing he knows that I will say left, right, left, right, ultimately I will go left. God knows. And I think to myself, should I go left, right, left, right, okay, left. I think I made a decision. Did I make it or God make it? Did God know it beforehand or not? If you believe in the omniscience of God, and all definitions of God include that phrase, that he knows all, everything, how can you then say that your free will, your selection, is a separate thing from God's own will? It's part of it. But what has happened is that God's will is hidden from us. And therefore, we feel we have the free will. It's a great gift to us. It's a great gift that God should hide and make us feel that we have the free will. What is the advantage? We can become seekers. We can seek God. Supposing you don't have this, you won't seek God. Seeking God is the highest act of free will. 
to be able to seek the truth inside you or outside anywhere is a seeking that's a gift of God available to us in a human body. There are life forms around us, even though trees have life outside, little insects have life, birds have life, mammals, animals, everybody, all these life forms have the same life, same soul, same consciousness, but their consciousness is diminished to the point that they go on a program already made. They go by instincts, instinctive reactions, built into them, built into their DNA molecule. We also go by that. We also have all instinctive reactions built into our DNA molecule and that's how we live. But in between, we suddenly have an experience, I think I can make a choice. I can decide what to do. And that's the gift to us. This gift enables us to seek and because we can seek in a human body and what we seek is lying inside the human body in a small part of the human body called the head. That is a great gift to us. And quality meditation means to withdraw attention from where it is scattered, eventually even from the physical body. By putting your attention there, we are able to do it. There are three great gifts given to us as a human being. One, a physical body in which God himself sits and we also sit there and the whole world sits there. We can see. We can see the blueprint of entire creation inside. You see from where this creation is being projected. It's like going to a movie. When we go to see a movie, our attention is all on the screen. We see people moving on the screen. Nobody is moving actually, just shadows. But we are so careful to see now what's going to happen. Sometimes we sit on the edge of a chair. Some horrible thing is going to happen. Nothing is going to happen. But we are completely taken in by a movie that's real. According to Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, it's a great thing that we take drama as real. Because he thinks that by watching drama and taking it as real, we are able to do a purgation catharsis of our own emotions. We identify with the characters on the movie. That's why we get so involved in the reality of the movie. Now, when we are sitting in a movie hall, I don't think anybody ever turns his head around to see where the projector, from where this light is coming, casting shadows and making a movie. And nobody cares that the movie that is being shown is already fully filmed, pre-filmed, and just been shown. And now what is going to happen has already happened behind. It's already there. And we are thinking now what will happen next? It's already happened. So it's a good example of how we look at the world. We think now things will happen. The future will come. It's already there. Where? Behind the eyes. Inside. Just like the projectors behind us. If there was no film in the projector and no light behind that film, we'd never see anything. It's the same thing here. If there was no consciousness, the light of consciousness in us, and if there was no mind to create all this film in front of us, pre-filmed, if there's no mind to project on a screen of sensory perceptions and the physical world, you'd never see this world. So actually, where is the whole thing is being projected from is within us. How can we check it out? Go within. Answer always to these questions is go within and find out, check out. It's not you to go somewhere else. You, to, you are carrying the very equipment of discovery of every true thing, every truth, including God himself, including the creator, right inside you. So therefore, you don't have to go anywhere. You go within. Now, when you go within, then you discover that these were gifts given to us to have this experience of going within also. Also pre-written, also pre-filmed. But it looks like we are seeking now and we are finding now. It's a great adventure to go with it. Because you see so many truths which were hidden from you. So many truths which are so unexpected, so different from what you believed in. So many illusions are thrown away. So many conceptions that we have are thrown away because of the reality of what is happening. Now this high quality meditation requires that you put all your attention. The human body with equipment is the first gift. 
the fact that you have attention which can move around second gift attention is the only thing in our consciousness that we can move around anywhere we can't change the whole scene here but i can decide to put my attention one side or the other side i can put my attention my hand the flowers put my attention the picture that choice of moving attention wherever you like is a great gift to us if that were not there how could you put your attention on yourself so we use this great gift of attention on by putting it on ourselves third gift that we have the power to concentrate this attention wherever we like you go to a music orchestra and number of musical instruments are playing you like the drums better try to put your attention and concentrate on the drums drums become louder others become thin if you keep on putting attention on the drums you can hear only the drums and nothing else the power to concentrate your attention is the very secret in which you can discover everything within yourself and these are gifts given to us that we can put our attention behind the eyes on ourselves concentrated there thereby you become unaware of what is outside gradually you become unaware of your own body you open up in your experiences this simple meditation technique if we follow it's just a method to reach what to reach your own self and one of the early signs that you are reaching yourself is that the music that is emanating from yourself appears so the music is there all the time if we withdraw our attention from outside and put it there you can hear the music right now it's always there everybody has that so that is why if you want to follow the shortcut for kali yuga for the iron age today that's the best way to do to follow the method of going within catching the sound forgetting everything else once you catch the sound and hold on to it no meditation of any other kind is needed that sound itself can take you all the way back now this sound is so amazing because it represents consciousness it represents the truth therefore when you catch the sound the sound does not leave you even though the experiences keep on changing these experiences will change when you become unaware of a physical experience a new world opens up but the sound continues sound is a link between every experience that you have what does the sound actually mean in our own understanding the sound means the self our own self because it's coming from our self now remember if you know who you are even as a physical being then you go to sleep in the sleep you are somebody else you are younger or older or different a woman can dream that she is a man but even as a man she will say i am the woman who is a man the self that was there in the wakeful state persists in the dream state self never changes pa he chinese philosopher i told the story before had a dream that he was a butterfly and as a butterfly he was flying flitting around his wings and going in that garden which had such beautiful flowers and those flowers were radiating light and color he had never seen those flowers in real physical life at all and he said this must be really the truth and he went around all those flowers remarkable heavenly astral flowers and then he woke up and he wondered that experience was more real than this experience am i really a butterfly now having a dream that i am for he is the philosopher or am i for he is the philosopher who had a dream that he was a butterfly he told his friends he said i had such a strange dream in the dream i felt i was a butterfly and i was flying around the friend said don't be stupid you can't be a butterfly you don't look like a butterfly how can you be a butterfly you should not say you are a butterfly you should say i saw a butterfly flying in the dream why he said i never saw a butterfly i was flying i was flying i had the wings in fact i could never see my own eyes because i was seeing things as a butterfly what is the what's the moral of the story that no matter what form you have the self remains the same the same self that was far in the philosopher was the same self that was a butterfly 
you in whatever form you are even if you become formless the very self that you have today will be yourself when you go to a dream state no matter what form you have in a dream is the same self that wakes up and says i had a dream and i saw this not that you saw somebody else which are yourself that is why there's one thing in this entire creation this entire universe in all the experiences that never changes the self the self will never change and that is why if we define reality as that which never changes the only reality is the self it never changes experiences all change this world we are living in everything changes we grow old things change nations change planets planets change there great things happen everything gets destroyed and again reborn nothing is permanent but the self is permanent self remains the same that is why it's good to know that self realization is the highest achievement of reality and if you have total self realization you have total body realization because totality of the self is what we call the creative power is the total consciousness become the one when we find it's the origin of everything which is our true home then we discover the discovery of the self or the secret to god realization and that is why people say go within to find the truth and not search outside anywhere we read books by reading books we get some information intellectual information sometimes we think that by reading certain books we are getting salvation we call them scriptures we call them sacred books and we think by going on reading sacred books we are getting something i have seen lot of people very learned the only thing that they achieved in great measure was a great enhancement of their ego i have read so much i have read more than you have read i know all this what is what is the realization they got the i has become the i in the physical body has become so strong not i the self but i that wants to show off to others is the created universe which is the ego ego is a great distraction to meditation the reason why ego is a great distraction is it separates you from everything it separates human being from each other i and you is there no i there no you imagine that the i separates us from god i separates us from nature i separates us from people i separates us from everything it's the most separating thing that we have called the ego or i therefore when we are insisting on i all the time it's a great obstruction to be drawing attention and having a union with your totality with yourself i is totally independent from the self is the face of our mind is the face of a thinking machine our human mind is a wonderful computer like thinking machine probably the best computer is our own mind and therefore it functions like a computer it is processing input output everything is just like a computer memory is exactly like a computer it holds the memories like that processes them the same way so this mind of ours is a very good useful computer for us why was it given to the soul in this physical body and our other bodies that we have all bodies have the mind the mind was given so we can use it for many reasons use it for understanding use it for communicating use it for language use it for using using the mind for having great experience in a created world very good gift we are supposed to use our mind we are supposed to think what we want to think but what has happened over time we have thought we are the mind over time we have even forgotten who we are and because we have been thinking so much we have been thinking into believing that the thinking itself is our own self that because we can think that is i thinking the self thinking that's not true the self empowers the mind self is consciousness life life makes the mind alive life makes this ancestral sensory system alive life makes this physical body alive life makes everything alive so therefore the life makes mind alive consciousness makes all these alive we empower the mind to function we pull out the plug the mind can't function 
So the, we have put in the plug into the mind and then it speaks very nicely. You know, we all hear the mind speaking. We can every time hear the mind speaking because it never stops speaking. It speaks continuously. It's trained to speak continuously. And that's called the thought process. When we think, the mind is speaking in our head. We can tell the mind what to think. Or we can just keep quiet and listen to the mind thinking. There are two ways. If there's a machine, you put the machine on, machine will go on by itself. Or you can train it to do what you want it to do. If we want to make use of the mind, we can tell the mind what to think. Are we doing it? Most of us have forgotten how to do it. Most of us are listening to the mind to find out what we should do. We are, we made a slave, a servant, a computer of ours, which was given to us to service us. We made it to a master to tell us what we should do. I was told that another 20 years, there will be robots, there will be artificial intelligence built into computers, and they will tell us what to do. I said, we don't have to wait 20 years, we are doing it right now. <laughs> we are using a computer to tell us what to do. We are continuously being guided by our own minds. The mind thinks bizarre, randomly, and picks up bits of information here, there, some good experience, some bad experiences, picks up pain and pleasure, puts them all together, and says, now do this. And we say, yes, sir. <laughs> what, a, what kind of a relationship do we have with a computer? This was not given to us for that purpose. The mind was given to us to put into it what we like to think what we like, to communicate what we like, to talk what we like, to do what we like. Now, when we say that we can tell the mind to do these things, who are we? Where, where is that self which is going to tell the mind? We must know where the self is, otherwise we can't tell the mind. The function of the mind is so different from the independent function of this soul, of our own self. Two cannot be confused. Our own self knows everything. When it's hidden by the mind, we forget ourselves, we don't, we forget our knowledge also. But knowledge seeps in once in a while through a process called intuition. What is intuition? Intuition is a flash of knowledge, a sudden feeling. You know it. That's intuition. An intuitive knowledge does not require the mind because there's no thought involved. All functions of the mind, thinking, reasoning, putting things together, logic, coming to conclusions, making sense of things, all require time. Not even the smallest thought will be in no time. They'll all take time. Even nanosecond is a time for the thought to come. Intuition takes no time. It's sudden, comes at once. And we just know. We know without time. And we just know it. The mind argues about our intuitive knowledge and makes us go down and follow the mind and not our intuition. Have you ever tried this experiment? Okay, for one week, I will not listen to what the mind says. I'm going to listen to my hunches and my gut feelings and my intuition. Your life will change in one week. You will make a mind, a true computer to service you. It doesn't take long. You just have to have a realization why this equipment has been given to us. The thinking machine is a very useful thing, but use it. Now we can, when we say, repeat this mantra, what are we trying to do? We're telling the mind to use these words. Mind doesn't want to do it. That's a, that's a use of the mind. When you tell the mind, think on these lines and do this work for me, it's taking use of the mind or not. Only when we consult the mind and act on it, then we are reversing the actual use of the mind. It's not supposed to be like that. Now, if you want to know where intuition comes from, it comes from the soul, your own self, requires no time, and is expressed directly by your consciousness through your spiritual will, the will of the spirit. You fall in love with somebody, it doesn't take time. Love has never taken time. 
to contemplate upon it, to think what happened, takes time because then the mind is being used. But the first experience of love is so sudden, you cannot relate it to time. It's an experience of the soul. All experience of love is spiritual soul, is spiritual love no matter where. There's a third thing. We look at beauty, suddenly it dawns upon it, so beautiful. Later on we examine where the beauty is and sometimes by examining too much we destroy the beauty. But this, these functions of feeling of joyful beauty suddenly, of having an intuitive knowledge suddenly, of falling in love and experiencing it suddenly are spiritual functions of the soul. There is a spiritual will involved in these. If you act upon these things, it's functioning of the spiritual will. But if you act upon what your thoughts are, that's a mental will. If you have to think out and say, I think so much, therefore I will do it, and next day you regret, oh, sorry, I did this. You'll be surprised how accurate the intuitive will is. We don't use it. If you just decide that you will make all major decisions in life, there you come across a decision-making opportunity with your hunch, with your intuitive feeling, with your gut feeling, and then ask the mind to carry it out, your life will change. Yes, you're putting the right place, they're putting the mind at the right place. That is why we should be using the mind. The mind can be used for meditation, mind can be used, the attention flows from the mind. Then we say, put your attention, we are making use of the mind. These are great functions that are available to all of us. Now, just because we have reversed the whole course of experience, instead of knowing we are projecting an experience for a certain reason, just to have a variety of experiences in order to go back home and say, wow, it's so nice to be back home. Instead of that, we are involved in this reality and thinking this is the only real thing. We did not come here at all to stay here. We came for a visit. Our souls did not come to inhabit this universe. They came for a visit to have an experience. And they're supposed to go back home. We got so caught up. It's like going to a carnival, going to an amusement park, enjoying there and then settle down there. Oh, it's so nice here, I don't want to go home. No, there's supposed to be a day visit and go back home. We are supposed to be in this world exactly for that. To go have variety, strange, high and low experiences. Bungee jumping experiences, <laughs> roller coaster experiences in life. Then go home where we don't have these experiences. But these experiences are in such stark, stark contrast to our life at home. We appreciate it far more after these experiences. There's a story told by some old saints, Kabir and others in books like Anurag Sagar, where they made a story of creation. And they say that there is, a, there is a great place called our true home, Sajkhand. We are all souls from there. We all came from there. And uh, we, we were part of Satpurush, the only God, only creator. Uh, and we are just part of him. Now we became souls, became many out of one. And then we, some of us said, let's have some adventure. Others were happy. It was a very blissful state to be there. So some of us said, okay. And that huge population, for 10% said, Let's go. They're giving you all, uh, rough numbers. 10% said, okay, let's go and have some adventure into new experiences. And we left. First, we had the experience of individuation. We are a separate soul. We are separate from the creator. We were not. It's a created experience. Then we said, okay, now we want to expand experience into something called time-space. He picked on a mind. A mind created time and space for us, created events for us, put events for his timeline. And we moved from one, we began to time travel from one event to another, he called it life. That's where we are. So we go from one event to another and have all this great time that one day after this great experience, we'll go back home. And then we go back home. Some of us go back home. 10% of the 10%, 1% go back home. Then when they go back home, we feel so happy because we have an experience of the opposite type. And the other souls there say, what is so special with you? You're dancing and singing even louder than us. What's so special with you? You're also souls like us. And we tell that you don't know what you're missing. Because he's never seen anything else. The real reason for this is consciousness 
operates best when it experiences pairs of opposites. And that is why all the experiences in this physical world are based upon pairs of opposites. All the experiences in our heavenly or astral worlds is based upon pairs of opposites. All our experiences in the mental world are based upon pairs of opposites. But there are no opposites in our true home. Now, if there is no opposite there, how we experience there? We experience through a world of opposites, through a world of duality, and the duality becomes an opposite of the world of non-duality. So artificially we have created an opposite to better appreciate our own, own, own state, our own world. This is a great move, great move by totality of consciousness to create an artificial opposite where there is no real opposite and to have greater experience of its own reality. So when we go back, we realize how great our true home is, what it means to be there. Because we have seen the opposite of it in this world of duality and pairs of opposites. The whole game of creation is set up on this great model. And we don't see it as a game, we see it as a reality. But that's great to see it as reality. Supposing we didn't see it as reality. Supposing it was only a shadow. Supposing all creation was just a shadow or a wall. And we see the shadow and go back would make no effect on us. So we did not create shadows, we created reality. But we used a very good method to create reality. We put a projector to project, hide the projector behind and what was being projected became reality. We hid ourselves. We hid the reality within ourselves so that we only see the projected part which becomes reality. Physical reality is created like that. Astral reality is created like that. Causal reality created like that. Even the reality of our true home, such can be created like that. Everything is being created from consciousness, the same process. So when we see, we don't create illusions and shadows. We create realities. And reality can be created in many ways. One of the ways is to block the source of reality. So that we only see what is created and that looks real. One major reason. Second reason is to introduce within that reality a desire to check if it is real or not based upon that reality alone. For example, I want to check is this table real or not? Am I making it up or is it really existing? I look, I can see the table. I can touch it. Is this water real? Or, or am I just making it up? Real, I just tasted it. Now imagine, supposing I am sleeping and having a dream of the same state. In the dream, I see the table. In the dream, I see the cup of water. In the dream, I say, is this real or not real? And I pick up the glass and sip and say, real? I put down, then I wake up, nothing was real. What happened to that reality? Because I had blocked the awareness of a wakeful state, I made the dream state into a reality. The experience of the dream was real. The things of the dream were not real. People have described in our Indian scriptures that this world is Maya. Mithya. Maya means illusion. That's a translation they give. It's not a correct translation. I'll explain. Maya, they say it's Maya, it's illusion. And they say it's Mithya, that means destructible. It's, it's changing. When they say Maya and they translate illusion, it would mean it's not real. You can see it's not real. That's not true. The experience of Maya is real, 100% real. But the objects which we think are creating the experience are not real. And this is the illusion that we, from an experience, make the object of experience real. That's how reality is being created. I can give, I gave an example of a dream. If I had the same experience in a dream, I would think it's real so long as I'm dreaming. Only when I wake up, I'll find I made up the dream. I made up that cup of water. I can't say that before that. Supposing in the dream I want to check out and I do all this, I say, okay, maybe I'm very lucid dream. Now I'm having a more lucid dream. In the dream, I'm feeling it's a dream. Okay, I know it's a dream. And I want to check it out. I'll ask three, four people, what do you see? Do you also see them? Oh, you also see them. Well, then it's real. We wake up. Now neither those people are there nor the things are there. 
when we try to verify reality by objects within that reality, that's how we are doing it. Entire empir empirical science is based upon that. Entire verification of reality being done outside is based upon outside. That's why they can never find reality. The only way to find reality is to wake up. Wake up and find it was like a dream. And when that happens, then you feel so great. I now find it was real. Then you go to sleep again. Another dream comes and the dream becomes real again. What happened to the reality of your wake process? You remember some of it. Looks like a dream. People have this problem right here. They say we have such great experiences in meditation. But when we are back in the physical body, we are not sure was it the mind that made it up. Or was it really? But it looked very real. Look looked more real. But now it looks like a dream. Naturally. Because you are only experiencing one reality at one time. When we come back to physical reality, even astral dreams, higher spiritual dreams, they look like dreams because we are taking this as real, they must be like dreams. And yet the <coughs> persistence that that must be real. It can only be real when this is not real. Now this is a great thing to make reality, that make only one reality at a time. So we are physical world, this is real. Everything is real here. And when we are dream state, that is real. Wake up, that's unreal. We wake up from this state to higher level of awakening, this becomes unreal. We awaken to a still higher level, all of them below become unreal. We go to our true home, everything was dream. Everything was dream like created. That means we can nearly, really never, as human beings, never be completely convinced about any of these things. Are we always going to be in doubt if it was real or not? There is a way to get convinced. And that is to reach the totality of consciousness, not a level of reality. When you are examining different layers of consciousness, when you are examining different levels of consciousness, you will always have one reality. Others will be unreal or imagination. When you go to the next, that becomes real, everything else is imagination. But when you go to the totality of consciousness, then the whole show is taking place there. After that, you can be in any state, all are real and all are unreal, and you know the whole game. And yet, you can still be a human being in a human body. So there is a way. The way is not to stop halfway. Go all the way to your true home. When you go to your true home, then the whole thing becomes clear and so wonderful. Because then you live at all realities. You are aware of all realities. And you work in all realities. Imagine these perfect living masters who come here and look like ordinary human beings like us. What's the difference between them and us? The difference is they have that experience of all realities and all illusions. They have the experience while they are sitting here, while they are talking to us here. They are having the experience of their true home. They don't say, we once went to a true home and now we have come to teach you something. They are experiencing the true home when they are talking to us as human beings. Any one of us can be like that. These perfect living masters don't come to make us better people. A thousand reformers were making us, trying to make us better people. Most of them fail, but anyway, they're trying. <laughs> and there's so many people who are trying to reform our lives and make them better. There's so many technical things happening to make our lives easier and better. Perfect living masters don't come for that. They don't come here to change anything here. They come here to pick up those souls which are ready to go home. The ones, when they left their true home, said, what, what if we are tired of that experience? What if we don't like it anymore? What if we are fed up, don't want to be there anymore? They got an assurance from totality itself. At that time, the totality of consciousness will appear in a human form and take you back home. That's actually the role of a perfect living master. A perfect living master is a human being with that consciousness comes to take those who are ready, who are at that time ready. Now, if somebody says, I am a great seeker, but I love this world, don't believe him. <laughs> I'm seeker of real truth. Well, let him find real truth in nature then. Because he's all outside. His truth lies outside. 
he need not go to a perfect living master. He can go to other masters who teach him other things. But a person who says, this is, I found out this is not my place. My life has taught me a lesson. I don't belong here. I feel it. I don't belong here. And I want to seek where I belong. When that feeling comes, you are ready. And when you are ready, a perfect living master appears in your life. He is so ordinary, there is no way you can find him. If you go out searching for a perfect living master, you never find one. Because you will find hundreds of people claiming to be perfect living masters, claiming to be enlightened, claiming to have so much awareness and knowledge. When they claim, they have not even controlled their ego. What else will they control? By making those claims, they are showing off what they have. They are not realized souls at all. Perfect living masters never say that they are masters. They never claim. What they claim is they have come to be our friends, to have a hand of friendship because they recognize us. And we recognize them too with a little, little bit of doubt. Our mind is functioning. Mind has given, mind has been programmed to create doubt. A very good thing. People may say it's not good to doubt. I say it's a very good thing. If you did not doubt, you would never seek clarification. You would never, you would be gullible. Anybody says anything, you would believe it. <laughs> doubt and skepticism is very good on the spiritual path. Unless you have doubt and skepticism, you will never probe further into the truth. You just accept whatever it says and you will be a victim of blind faith. But this path is not a blind faith. Therefore, skepticism is good and you should question. Question. Let the mind be active in questioning and have reasonable satisfaction. Okay, I am willing to give it a try. What happens meanwhile? While the mind is doing this, questioning and skepticism, he is perfectly being mastered doing something else, which we don't notice originally. They are showering some love upon us which sometimes creeps in, sometimes other. Slowly it creeps in more. Slowly it soaks us. And slowly we forget the mind even. That love is overpowering. Because love is not coming from the mind. Neither of the master nor ours. Therefore, it's the unconditional love of a master that really pulls us and subdues the mind. And answers all questions that the mind was asking. Questions become irrelevant. We feel we don't have any questions left. What makes us do that? What makes a strong skeptic, a person full of doubts, suddenly turn and say, I have no more questions. What, is, what has happened? It's an experience of love that you never experienced before. What's the difference in the love that we experience with such a person whom we call a perfect living master and other loves that we have? Most loves are based upon give and take. I love you, do you love me? That question is there. It is an experience of two. Experience of you and the beloved and exchange. The conditions attached. The love of a perfect living master is always completely unconditional. There is no judgment involved. A perfect living master does not come to judge us. He knows that we are judging ourselves with our mind all the time. Judgment is a trap by itself. We have put ourselves in a big trap. By enabling a machine, a mind to keep judging us and then saying, oh, you did wrong and putting guilt which we carry for life sometimes. What kind of life is this where we are putting more and more guilt into ourselves by a judgment of our own mind? And that's our life. Suddenly, a human being appears in our life whose love is unconditional. He loves you whether you love him or not. He loves you if you hate him. He loves you if you kill him. That kind of love is not ordinary. And that's the kind of love that comes from true perfect living master. If this is not there, I would say it's not a perfect living master. I think the most essential qualification of a perfect living master with that awareness is his love should be completely non-judgmental and unconditional. But the effect upon us of unconditional love is so strong that the mind's doubts, no matter how many they were, no matter how much skepticism you have, that love overpowers and makes the mind sit aside.
Otherwise, the mind is always in front. Now look at, love is not only with a perfect living master or with God or with totality. Love is with people. We love the master too because all these are human beings, ordinary human beings. Why do we love him? Because we are responding to his love. We always respond. And very often the love that we are expressing is called devotion. That is why love and devotion go together. And we are, in a way, responding when we say we are loving. We are, devotion, we are devoting. And devotion starts developing in us automatically response to love. When we love a human being, ordinary human being, it's true love. If the mind were kept aside. But when the mind comes in, we destroy true love. Same thing with joy and beauty. We feel joy, mind starts interfering, explaining things, and we lose it. You look at beautiful picture. I love this picture of great master here. I see the picture. Oh, I remember my master. I remember everything I remember just by looking at a picture. Now, supposing I were to cut this picture into small pieces, take one square inch of this very picture, and put them on this table. The whole picture is on the table. I'll pick up one by one, one by I can see those pieces thousands of times. I'll never see this picture. That's how we see love in this world. We break it into pieces. Because our consciousness operating as consciousness, as intuitive force, sees the whole picture. The mind divides it into pieces, analyzes it. The function of our spiritual self is synthesis putting things together, the function of mind is analysis, breaking apart to see what it is, to understand. We are breaking our totality of awareness of this physical world even, or our creation, by dividing into moments, here and there, now and then. This cutting into pieces. This scissors of time and space cut our life into pieces and we can't see the beauty of it. If you can see the whole picture together, which you can, if you keep the mind aside, love will shine out. Beauty will shine out. Even in the creation. Creation is beautiful too. We don't see it like that. Because we analyze too much. We break it too much. Now therefore, whereas it is necessary to use the skepticism of the mind in order to be not gullible and go into blind faith, it is also necessary to see where the mind's limitation is. The mind can, by the way, teach us its own limits also. That mind can see everything, think about everything, so long as it is in time and space. Supposing I tell you there is a timeless, spaceless stage, which is so beautiful, nobody can understand it. Because we are trying to understand, all understanding is mental. So to say I can describe a space, place that has no space and no time, makes no sense to the mind. It makes sense to the soul. Soul can still say there, is, there can be such a place. But the mind cannot see it or examine it. These are totally different functions. The mind performs only in time and space. And the spiritual self does not require that. So we can convert our life into a spiritual life just by following our spiritual will. Living through intuitive will, cut feeling, and making the mind service that decision of ours. If we make our decisions intuitively and live with a mind that works them out, not, not making decisions for us. Mind is a very bad decision maker. Our gut feeling is a much better decision maker. And there's a reason for that. The mind makes its decision based upon data available to it in memory. Whatever it can know at that time in memory is what is the decision based on. It can't do everything. Therefore, the limited data. Next day, more data comes in. Our decision was wrong. We change it. It's got a limitation. But the gut feeling does not come from any uh, limited memory. It comes from our totality of experience. There's a big difference in the two. And that's why the intuitive feeling is a much stronger force, but we have subdued it because of our mind. So when we want to reassert ourselves, and lead a spiritual life, then we should put the mind in its own proper place, use it fully, 
It's a very good tool. Use it fully, but don't get used by it. Don't let the mind make your decisions. You make your decisions and make the mind work them out. This very process can be used in meditation to go within. Because we have to use the mind. We have to use the mind to persuade the mind to walk in. Unless you have a spiritual will to make the mind go inside, it won't go in. I have heard people say when we meditate, our mind thinks of everything. If you have lost out keys, the mind will try to find them at that time. If you have forgotten something, mind tries to remember at that time. And if it cannot, it goes to sleep. There is no easy way to cure sleeplessness than by meditating. You don't need any pills for that. This is all tricks of the mind. Just to keep us busy with these things and not discover our true self. Because if we discover our true self, we leave the mind behind. Mind was not, is not built into our true home, into our soul. It's just an accessory added on during the process of creation. It's just an added accessory. Therefore, we leave it behind when we go above that. This is what I have shared with you and the teachings of this great master whose Bandara we celebrate. Tomorrow is a great day. Their blessings will be immense and I will be a witness to those. I am very, very happy that you all come to join me. If you are not here, I would still be having Bandara. Somebody told me if nobody comes, will there still be a Bandara? I said yes. Two people will be there. I and my master. The Bandara is complete. When I and my master are there, Bandara is complete. When you join us, it becomes better. More company, more people to share this great joy and this great opportunity to know that these teachings of this great master have an opening for us. And by getting this awareness, this knowledge that this opening is available to us, we can work on it and get our own dreams fulfilled. If we have dreams of going to our true home, if we have dreams of getting God realization, if we have dreams of knowing what the self is, if we have those dreams, those dreams can be fulfilled by the teachings that I have just shared with you. So I will be very happy and have a break now. I will be very happy to see you again in the afternoon in a couple of hours.